I want to welcome you to our Great Books a series for 2022 uh, as we now begin a contemplation of one of the great masterworks, certainly of the 20th century, uh, Victor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, I chose this book in consultation uh, with Georgie because I wanted to explore his experiences in the concentration camps of World War II uh, as what Barbara Tuckman would refer to as a distant mirror of our world today. You may remember uh, her, her work on the bubonic plague that hit Europe in 1348 and lasted for 60 years and decimated uh, probably a quarter of the human population from Iceland uh, to India over and over again. Uh, it was a very debilitating experience for the world generally, I think for Europe in particular. Uh, although out of it, as fate would have it and the mysterious workings of history, out of it came the Renaissance. And so uh, she wrote that, about that experience as a distant mirror for what we're experiencing uh, today. So it's in that spirit of Barbara Tuckman and a distant mirror that I wanted to explore the work of Viktor Frankl, because I think uh, his insights uh, can serve as a guide in our world. One of the truest things about what is happening is that we're all suffering. And we're all suffering with what's happening in the Ukraine. Uh, we're watching a major power uh, invade a small uh, defenseless power. We know it's being done because of certain historical factors. Russia needing a buffer on its eastern flank. Uh, the United States and NATO refusing to provide uh, Russia that buffer. Uh, and so in 2008, uh, when NATO uh, decided, declared that it was now going to absorb Ukraine and the Republic of Georgia, uh, the Russians said this would constitute an existential threat, that they would not allow that to happen under any circumstances. Uh, and if you remember the U.S. response to the Cuban Missile Crisis back in 1962 when the Russians tried to put missiles in Cuba, um, you get a measure of what's happening. So I want to call this topical situation out because sometimes we all get caught, as Viktor Frankl did, in the massive megatrends of history, and they cause us all to suffer. Because for reasons that are unknown, we humans seem to have almost a congenital defect around solving our challenges before they become crises. We, we're not very good at doing that. Um, we have COVID uh, still playing itself out in many uh, parts of the world. It seems to be ebbing. But over the last two years, uh, we've all suffered due to COVID because essentially we've all been under martial law. We've been under lockdowns. We've been under um, social distancing. We've been having to wear masks. We've been uh, social beings unable to socialize in any meaningful way. Uh, we discovered Zoom and we've tried to do it through Zoom and, and we're doing it uh, as we speak right now. And, there's a certain intimacy that always emerges when humans have contact uh, in any way, uh, but nothing takes the place of personal contact. And if you look at the indicators, uh, literally worldwide, mental health, psycho-emotional health, physical health uh, has taken a major hit because of, of the pandemic. We're also in code red for the climate. We're now in a situation where uh, all over the world, we're experiencing escalating 
climactic turbulence. Uh, in the news just this morning, uh, there were pictures of videos of the unbelievable flooding uh, in uh, southwest uh, Australia around Sydney, where entire cities have just, the, the water moved in so fast that the cars were literally floating away. And uh, so uh, as we look around us, I just wanted to enter into this program today uh, in a spirit of deep empathy uh, for the suffering that all of us are bearing witness to uh, and experiencing as the world turns uh, with forces bigger than we are, mostly unknown. But when they crash upon us, they can sweep us away. So how we maintain our presence of being in the maelstrom, not of our choosing, is an act of spiritual insight, and I would say moral discipline, that we're having to learn in ways we never expected before the onset of the pandemic two years ago, and now with climate in code red and an invasion of Ukraine. None of us saw any of this coming. And similarly, even though it was completely, it's completely obvious to us today that the Nazis would rise in Germany, given the conditions that we now understand, most of the world at that time had as little idea about what was going on than uh, Russia invading Ukraine. It was a black swan event. It's what they call a black swan event, where in hindsight, it looks absolutely inevitable predictable. But at the time, people experience it as an astonishing disruption of normalcy. So I want to bring that aspect in too, as we contemplate what's happening today, but we also contemplate what happened uh, back in Germany, as we explore uh, the life and writings of Viktor Frankl as a distant mirror uh, to our own, the unexpected nature of world events, which only in hindsight follow any discernible logic. Viktor Frankl was born in 1905 uh, to a modest uh, but successful Jewish family in Vienna. He was precocious uh, from a very early age. Uh, and he was fascinated uh, as an early teenager by psychiatry. He was one of those people that knew exactly what he wanted to do when he grew up. Um, I'm still not quite sure what I want to do when I'm growing up. Uh, but he was one of those people who absolutely knew he wanted to be a doctor. And he wanted to get into psychiatry. And when he was only a teenager, uh, he was writing Sigmund Freud, who was also in Vienna. They lived in the same city together. Uh, and uh, then he went off to the uh, University of Vienna. Uh, and uh, when uh, he was there, he uh, specialized in uh, uh, psychological uh, studies uh, and in particular, um, looking at suicide and depression. Uh, he was uh, uh, involved with uh, uh, Ralph Adler's group, uh, which I'll uh, go into uh, in just a moment. Uh, and um, uh, he was expelled from that group because he didn't adhere to Adler's notion that the fundamental category uh, was power. And uh, little old uh, young uh, Viktor Frankl said, no, it's not about power. The, the, the deepest motivation of a human being is around meaning. 
And when he was only 21, <laughs> I mean, what were you doing when you were 21, right? When he was 21, Viktor Frankl developed his whole theory on what he called logal therapy. Uh, uh, the assertion that meaning was the fundamental category. And I want to um, just fill that out for a moment uh, before we dive into the rest of his story, uh, because it offers us a, um, <clears throat> a way in to who he was and a way in to how one navigates through extreme suffering. Let's start with Freud. Freud, in the end, masterful genius that he was, said that the basic impulse that humans have is around eros, around the pleasure principle, around sex. Uh, around the id, what he called the id, that when we're born, we just want our, you know, we want to eat when we want to eat, we want to do what we want to do, and we, we are governed exclusively by the oceanic pleasure principle. And all of a sudden we learn that that's not the way the world works. That you've uh, uh, got to go to the bathroom before you defecate. That if you're gonna eat, you have to demonstrate certain manners. So at a very early age, Freud said, we start to be socialized through the coercive force of civilization. And that what happens is we're socialized coercively to modify our pleasure principle, we begin to develop a superego so that our conscious says, you know, you have to drive on the right side of the road. You have to use your fork in your right hand and your knife in your left hand. Those are all functions of the superego. And that because the superego is pressing down on the pleasure principle, we just want to have pleasure all the time. We develop neuroses. And because we don't deal with them, we repress them, they start manifesting as neurotic complexes. You know, you start to have a twitch or your arm starts to be paralyzed or you get ill. So Freud's genius was that if you, you know, lie somebody down, you have them tell your story, you start to look into those deeper recesses of the unconscious that you can heal. And uh, uh, he learned this, by the way, just so you know uh, how, how small the events are that cause the revolutions of psychology uh, in Paris, uh, where he was there with a doctor that was in this ward and everybody was literally paralyzed. They had some paralysis. Some people couldn't move their arms. But what they discovered is if you put people in hypnosis and get them to talk, their arm comes down, they uh, interact perfectly normally. And then when they're out of hypnosis, their arm becomes paralyzed again. And that insight of Freud's was the genesis of psychoanalysis. One of his students was Adler. And Adler said, no, that, uh, I, I, I think that's an, a factor. But if you look at human beings, they're always in power relationships. Even the baby and the mother, it's a power relationship. I want to be fed. No, you can't be fed. And that as we get older, we refine the instrumentality of how we exert power over others. And that power, uh, if you've looked at Lord of the Rings, is the corrosive element in human relationships. 
And because of power differentials, women under men, nature under humanity, uh, the colonializers and the colonized, um, racial domination. It's all power relationships, according to Adler. So it's not about pleasure. It's about how we adjudicate, understand, and solve the problems of power. Jung had a different idea. Uh, for Jung, it was uh, the issue of uh, spiritual development of one's individuation process uh, as one comes into a relationship with the archetypes that come out of the unconscious to shape conscious behavior uh, uh, and attitudes. And uh, so for, for Freud, for example, to be religious was a sign of a neurotic symptom. And for Jung to be religious was not a neurotic symptom, uh, it was the pathway to individuation. So the spiritual and religious dimension uh, for Jung, uh, the, the self, the totality of the psyche, that is what was most important uh, in human development. Uh, and it was Jung who was the first one to understand that this isn't just, you know, happens in Jim's life but I'm a mere flotsam in the river of time. And I carry in my psyche, ultimately, all the memories of the entire universe, you know, since the Big Bang. And that's what makes, according to Jung, life so complex. Well, little old Viktor Frankl, <laughs> uh, in his early 20s, said, I have another idea. I don't think it's about pleasure or power or religion. I think it's about meaning. And it's not some thing out of my unconscious. It's about how I interact with the circumstances in which I find myself. And we're going to go into the formal aspects of logotherapy uh, next lecture. And I want to now dwell on his life and his book in this lecture, but I just wanted to frame as we, we begin our contemplation of Viktor Frankl, where he from a very early age began to demarcate himself uh, in, the, in the burgeoning field of psychoanalysis, uh, psychology, uh, psychotherapy. Uh, he was actually one of the, uh, the founders of that whole domain, along with these other giants. Um, and uh, it, very quickly, uh, he started to work in the neurology department in uh, a major hospital uh, in Vienna. Uh, then he had to switch hospitals because with the rise of Nazism, uh, certain hospitals said that Jews could not uh, have, you know, staff positions. So he had to move to a hospital. And then in 1942, when he was 38 years old, he was sent to the camps. Uh, he had just been married. Uh, his wife uh, was uh, pregnant. Uh, they were forced to have an abortion. So I want to bring this in because just imagine, just married, and your wife is pregnant, and then all of a sudden, the house comes down. There's an invasion. There's a pandemic. In this case, there's the Nazis. And all of a sudden, your normal life as a successful psychiatrist motivated 100% to help people. All of a sudden, you realize that because you happen to be Jewish, you're taking it in the teeth. Not because of anything you did. You never broke a law. 
but just simply because of your racial identity, which is hard to take in. In the book, he recounts that because of his fame, uh, he uh, was offered the opportunity to leave. And he had uh, an experience uh, at his father's house, which is worth detailing. His parents were old, they were failing. He knew that to leave them would be to leave them to a fate that at that moment he did not know, but he knew enough to know it would be bad. But he had his own life. He had a wife, child on the way. He was seeing the handwriting on the wall. He went over to his father's house and he noted a, a little sherd on the table. And he asked his father what that was. And he says, oh, that was something that came out of a synagogue that was burnt and torn down by the Nazis. And uh, he looked at it and it was part of the Ten Commandments. And it happened to be the Sixth Commandment, honor thy father and thy mother. And when he read that, in that instant, Victor Frankel knew he could not abandon his parents. Now that's a that's an act of such nobility, everyone. And such honor that we all should just pause and take in the gravity of that act of magnanimity in that moment. And that's when one's character is revealed for everything that it is. So he went consciously to the concentration and extermination camps with his family, knowing he could have escaped, but going through the path of deeper meaning. Make a long story very short, because I want to get into some of the issues that he deals with in his book. Uh, his father, his mother, his brother uh, were gassed. Uh, his wife uh, died of typhus at uh, Bergen-Belsen concentration camp. Uh, Viktor Frankl himself was in four different camps in three years. Uh, his sister uh, managed to escape from Auschwitz. Uh, I don't know the details. Uh, and then uh, as the Russians advanced in the spring of 1945 and around April, uh, May of 1945, uh, he found himself uh, liberated and he went back to Vienna. And uh, one of the first things that he did was enroll in a PhD program. He got his PhD on the subject of what he called the unconscious God, looking at the role of religion uh, in the domain of suffering. And uh, then in 1946, in only nine days, he wrote Man's Search for Meaning, where he chronicled those salient moments uh, in his experience in those four concentration camps, uh, out of which he came to understand uh, the power of meaning in the context of unexplainable, completely irrational suffering. So I want to dig in and uh, uh, read some passion uh, 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 portions uh, out of uh, his work that enable us to, through his own experiences, fathom the profundity of the teachings uh, that became 
uh, his corpus uh, in uh, logotherapy. Uh, although Man's Search for Meaning was uh, his first book, he ultimately wrote, wrote 39 other books uh, and died at a ripe old age uh, in his 90s. I think he was 93, 94 uh, in 1997. Uh, so uh, that's the, the life of Viktor Frankl. What I want to tease out in this uh, uh, lecture uh, today uh, is the essential point that he makes, that it was possible for spiritual life to deepen even in a concentration camp. And that's really important. You know, as we look around the world today, we say, you know, and I say often, this is complete madness. How can, I mean, what's going on? Who's in charge here? Why does it keep getting worse and worse? And that reaction to circumstances we don't over understand and over which we have essentially no control creates a powerlessness and as Frankel noted a cynicism and despair that can break our health and terminate our lives so how we're responding to what's going on is the critical element in our health, our well-being, and in our capacity to uh, create the kind of meaning we need in order to flourish. And if you can flourish even in a concentration camp, you can flourish anywhere. And that's what Viktor Frankl did by understanding that no matter what your context, there's a spiritual thread, there's an Ariadne's thread that if you find it and you follow it, leaves, leads to a transformation of your own soul as a result of which you can endure anything. Anything. Even death itself with dignity, with nobility, with compassion. That's the fundamental insight of Viktor Frankl out of Auschwitz. So I wanna just read uh, a few paragraphs and comment as we go along, because it's such rich material and I urge all of you to read it, uh, those of you who haven't because it is just sublime. Um, but he talks about the ceaseless marches, getting up in the freezing dark before dawn and marching and the shoes don't fit and there's pus and edema and which is your swelling of your limbs because you're starving and and you know nine men in the in a, a bed which isn't even a bed it's just it's just boards and the urine and the feces and the snoring and the sickness and the foulness of the air and the groans and you get up and you got to work for 12 hours and you know they're trying to work you to death. That was the point. To starve you and work you to death. And that's what you got to work through. So we stumbled on in the darkness over big stones and through large puddles along the one road leading from the camp. The accompanying guards kept shouting at us and driving us with the butts of their rifles. Anyone with very sore feet supported himself on his neighbor's arm. Hardly a word was spoken, the icy wind did not encourage talk. Hiding his mouth behind his upturned collar, a man marching next to me whispered some suddenly, if our wives could see us now, I do hope they're better off in their camps 
and don't know what is happening to us. This brought thoughts of my own wife to mind. My mind clung to my wife's image, imagining it with uncanny acuteness. I heard her answering me. I saw her smile, a frank and encouraging look. Real or not, in that moment, her look was then more luminous than the sun which was beginning to rise. A thought transfixed me. For the first time in my life, I saw the truth as it is set into song by so many poets, proclaimed as the final wisdom by so many thinkers. The truth that love is the ultimate and highest goal to which man can aspire. The salvation of man is through love and in love. I suddenly understood how a man who has nothing left in this world still may know bliss, be it only for a brief moment in the contemplation of his beloved. Who is your beloved? You know, it was Rabia, actually, uh, the uh, Muslim mystic of the uh, eighth century in Saudi Arabia and Syria, the Middle East, who first coined the term beloved in discourse about God. That term didn't exist and was never used in all of history about God until Rabia, a woman mystic, uh, one of the original Sufis, the beloved. Rumi spoke about the beloved. Uh, in, in that cold morning, Victor Frankl uh, had an epiphany uh, that uh, love was absolute and that one's beloved was a gateway to the love that we all seek. In a position of utter desolation, when man cannot express himself in positive action, when his only achievement may consist in enduring his sufferings in the right way, in the honorable way. In such a position, man can, through loving contemplation of the image he carries of his beloved, achieve fulfillment. For the first time in my life, I was able to understand the meanings of the world. The angels are lost in perpetual contemplation of an infinite glory. All that was happening to him in a concentration camp. No mystic, no avatar in history has had a deeper insight than that insight about the reality of love and the efficacy of love through a contemplation of the beloved. And all through the day, my mind, he says, still clung to the image of, of my wife. A thought crossed my mind. I didn't even know if she was alive. I knew only one thing, which I have learned well by now. Love goes very far beyond the physical person of the beloved. Love finds its deepest meaning in our spiritual beings, our inner self. Whether or not he is actually present, whether or not he is still alive at all, ceases somehow to be importance in the presence of love. So his contemplation of his wife, he didn't even know if she existed, whether she was even still alive. But that didn't make it less real. Because the reality, deeper than his wife, was the presence of the beloved, was the presence of love. What an extraordinary thought. This intensification of the inner life, says Frankel, helps the prisoner, help the prisoner find a refuge from the emptiness, the desolation, and spiritual poverty 
of his existence in the camps. By letting him escape into the past. And as the inner life of the prisoner tended to become more intense, he also experienced the beauty of art and nature as never before. You know, when you're in love, the sky is bluer, everything tastes better. You're, that's why they say love is blind, right? Uh, because in the presence of love, when one has fallen into love, one has uh, a um, intensification of thought and word and deed such that even if the context is arduous, as it is in a concentration camp, you sort of forget about it because your interior life spills, as it were, through your cells and fills everything in your reality. That's the power of love. That's the power of, of meaning uh, in our lives. Another time he says we were at work in a trench. Uh, the dawn was gray around us. I sensed my spirit piercing through the enveloping gloom. I felt all of a sudden my spirit transcend that hopeless, meaningless world. And from somewhere I heard a victorious yes in answer to my question of the existence of an ultimate purpose. We don't understand what's going on in the world. We say, what's going on? Can there be any purpose? In Auschwitz, that question goes deeper to an ultimate existential level. And he was pondering, can there be any ultimate purpose in what is happening here? At that moment, a light was lit in a distant farmhouse, which stood on the horizon as if painted there. In the midst of the miserable gray of a dawning morning in Bavaria, the light shone in the darkness. For hours, I stood hacking at the icy ground. The guard passed by, insulting me. And once again, I communed with my beloved. More and more, I felt that she was present, that she was with me. I had the feeling that I was able to touch her able to stretch out my hand and grasp hers. The feeling was very strong. She was there. Then at that very moment, a bird flew down silently and perched just in front of me on the heap of soil which I had dug up from the ditch and looked steadily at me. Nature felt his epiphany and nature communicated solidarity. So he had this kind of issue that he was, <laughs> you know, becoming more and more alive, but all around him, people were just trapped in the suffering, in the carnage of the, of the camp. People were committing suicide. People were uh, 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 being shot. People were being gassed. People were doing that. But he realized that his interior life was getting more and more intense. And just finally on this point, uh, generally speaking, of course, he says, any pursuit of art was somewhat grotesque. I would say that the real impression made by anything connected with art and nature and love arose only from the ghost-like contrast between the performance and the background of a desolate camp life. I shall never forget how I awoke from the deep sleep of exhaustion on my second night in Auschwitz. I was roused by music. The senior warden of the hut had some kind of celebration in his room, which was near the entrance of the hut. Tipsy voices bawled some hackneyed tunes. Suddenly there was silence. And into the night, 
a violin sang, a desperately sad tango, an unusual tune not spoiled by frequent playing. Just a violin played. An unusual tune not spoiled by frequent playing. That's exquisite. The violin wept, and part of me wept with it. And on that same day, someone had a 24th birthday. That someone lay in another part of Auschwitz, possibly only a few hundred or thousand yards away, and yet completely out of my reach. That someone was my wife. That someone was my wife. Love is the fountainhead of meaning in the end. That's what Viktor Frankl discovered in Auschwitz. The next point I want to make uh, before we open it up for comments and questions is later on in his book where uh, he talks about the question of whether a person has a choice or not in the context of circumstances. And he says, the experiences of camp life do show that a man does have a choice of action. Man can preserve a vestige of spiritual freedom, of independence of mind, even in such terrible conditions of psychic and physical stress. He makes a beautiful line. Everything, he says, can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. The sort of person the prisoner became, in fact, says Frankel, was the result of the inner decisions that they made, not a result of the cap conditions alone. And this is at the heart of the Stoics. And I want to bring them in here for just a moment, because this is not an original idea of Frankel's. The ancient Stoics in Greece and in Rome, the Mediterranean, Mediterranean world from about the fourth century to the second, third century uh, AD uh, had as their cardinal principle that most of what happens in our life is beyond our control. We suffer because we don't understand that. We don't like the weather. We don't like uh, how our bodies turned out. Uh, we don't like this. We don't like that. And the Stoics said, that's not your concern. That's fate. That's life. There's only one area where you have ultimate power and none other. And that is how you respond to what happens to you. Because it is your response that is the only place where human beings have ultimate sovereignty. And if you think about that, that's pretty close to fundamentally true. I can't control the Ukraine. I can't control the pandemic. I can't control the weather. I can't even control what people think of me, but I can control how I respond to what happens to me. And that was a, a, an insight by uh, Frankel that I think is quite profound. And it was articulated and developed while he was in Auschwitz. 
where most of the people were saying, I have no blame, and they weren't sure how to respond. He quotes Dostoevsky, who said, there is only one thing that I dread, not to be worthy of my sufferings. An act of life serves the purpose of giving man the opportunity to realize values in creative work, while a passive life of enjoyment affords him the opportunity to obtain fulfillment in experiencing beauty, art, or nature. But there's also a purpose in that life which is almost barren of both creativity and enjoyment, and which admits but of one possibility of high moral behavior. Namely, in our attitude to our existence, an existence restricted by external forces. A creative life and a life of enjoyment are banned to him. But not only creativeness and enjoyment are meaningful, if there is a meaning in life at all, then there must be a meaning in suffering. Suffering is an ineradicable part of life, even as fate and death. Without suffering and death, human life cannot be complete. And then he tells the story of a young woman that he knew there in Auschwitz. The young woman knew that she was going to die in the next few days. But when I talked with her, she was cheerful in spite of this knowledge. I am grateful that fate has hit me so hard, she said. In my former life, I was spoiled and did not take spiritual accomplishments seriously. And then pointing through the window of the hut, she said, this tree here is the only friend I have in my loneliness. And through that window, she could see just one branch of a chestnut tree. And on that branch were two blossoms. I often talked to the tree, she said. I was startled and didn't quite know how to take her words. Was she delirious? Did she have occasional hallucinations? I asked her if the tree replied, oh yes, she said. What did he say, to, what did it say to you? She answered, it said to me, I am here. I am here. I am life. I am eternal life. So once again, when we open ourselves up to meaning, when we open ourselves up to love, to a deeper spiritual stratum, all of nature is open to us and expresses its comfort, whatever we are forced to endure. You know, that's why people love their dogs and love their pets. And they don't care who you are, what you look like. They just want to be your friend. That's nature befriending us in all of our multiplicity of experiences. And then just um, finally here, he quotes from Nietzsche. He who has a why can bear almost any how. That's at the heart of logotherapy. That's at the heart of man's search for meaning. As Nietzsche said, Anyone who has a how, has a why, excuse me, can endure almost any how. Whenever there was an opportunity for it, one had to give them a why and aim for their lives in order to strengthen them to bear the terrible how of their existence. Woe to him who saw no more sense in his life, no aim, no purpose, and therefore no point in carrying on. He was soon lost. So what Frankel is pointing out here is not academic 
to any of us. It's our interior life that makes the difference of our health and well-being and survivability and viability in the world. The typical reply, which such a man rejected all encouraging arguments was, I have nothing to expect from life anymore. What sort of answer can one give to that in Auschwitz? What can we expect from life anymore? And then his great insight. We had to learn ourselves. And furthermore, we had to teach the despairing around us that it didn't really matter what we expected from life. What matters is what life expects from us. And to me, this may be the most profound line of the entire book. It doesn't matter what we expect from life. What matters is what life expects from us. Life ultimately means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to its problems and to fulfill the tasks which it constantly sets for each individual. Questions about the meaning of life can never be answered by sweeping statements. Life does not mean something vague, but something very real and concrete, just as life's tasks are also very real and concrete. Every situation is distinguished by its uniqueness, and there is always only one answer to the problem posed by the situation at hand. And this is fundamental because, as he points out, in Auschwitz, asking about the meaning of life was an absurdity. Just a complete and utter absurdity. But once the meaning of suffering had been revealed to us, we refused to minimize or alleviate the camps tortured by ignoring them or harboring false illusions and entertaining artificial optimism or undue despair. Suffering then became a task on which we did not want to turn our backs because they understood it was the key to the meaning that would give them the power to survive the suffering. It's a fundamental point. That is, he says, uh, it's not what we expect from life. It's what life expects from us. That's the key. And just turning that around empowers our sense of agency, empowers our sense of agency. Their tears, he said, our tears bore witness that a man had the greatest courage, the courage to suffer. And just to conclude, since he was a specialist in suicide from an early age and depression, he said, I remember two cases of would-be suicide, which bore a striking similarity to each other. Both men had talked of their intentions to commit suicide. Both used the typical argument they had nothing more to expect from life. In both cases, it was a question of getting them to realize that life was still expecting something from them. Something in the future was expected of them. We found, in fact, that for one, it was his child whom he adored and who was waiting for him in a foreign country. For the other, it was a thing, not a person. This man was a scientist and had written a series of books which still needed to be finished. His work could not be done by anyone else and more than any other person could ever, and, and, and more than, than another person could ever take the place of the father of his child's affections. This uniqueness and singleness, which distinguishes each individual and gives a meaning to his existence has a bearing on creative work as much as it does on human 
life. This is very profound. You know, often in spirituality, you know, we listen to the Dalai Lama and we read the words of Jesus and we have this kind of grandiose sense of life and ultimate meaning and uh, cosmic love. And we get lost in these platitudes and words and concepts and philosophies. And Viktor Frankl says, none of that amounts to a hill of beans. It's all irrelevant. Every life is particular. Every life is unique. For one of the men, it was the child that he knew was still back home. Cling to that. Allow that to give you meaning and purpose and future, even in Auschwitz. For another, it was a scientific inquiry that nobody else had discovered, and only he could deliver out into the world. Cling to it, said Frankel. That's what's uniquely you. And that's at the heart of logotherapy, which we'll get to next time. That every life is specific. There are no generalities. There's only the way each individual within the context of his or her own circumstances works and acts and relates and suffers. And if out of that uniqueness that each one of us has, we are able to connect with our beloved, whoever or whatever that is, and no longer think that life um, uh, has to justify itself to us, but rather we need to justify ourselves to life, then, says Frank, not only does meaning begin to permeate everything, including your suffering, but you become empowered by love and you become healthier even in a death camp because you've learned the most fundamental truth that any of us can ever learn on this earth during our time and that is that love is the final presence that if we can touch it and allow it to subsume us our lives are transformed and meaning is gained that allows us to endure anything that life may cast our way. So thank you everyone. Those are my uh, few thoughts uh, today on uh, Viktor Frankl's search for meaning. Uh, Georgie, as we always do, will make the first comment. And then uh, I want to hear from all of you students and uh, put your hands up. You can raise your hand by uh, just, um, uh, there's a little uh, icon in the lower uh, menu bar of your Zoom uh, 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 viewing, and uh, we'll have a, our discussion. Thank you so much, Georgie. Wow, Jim, I think we all need to take a big breath now because this was just an amazing presentation. All your presentations are amazing, but I think in the midst of what's going on in Ukraine and what's been going on in the past couple of years in terms of the pandemic that uh, uh, we, we all we all shaken to uh, to a state where we never envisaged maybe like four or five years ago. I remember when my parents always said, who actually lived through the Second World War, that there are, there's so many things I wish for you, my girls, one of which is that you will never ever experience war and look what's going on now. Um, um, I remember when I received uh, Viktor Frankl's book, um, 
I put it aside for quite a long time because somehow intuitively I felt and this was going to be a very hard book to read and it will be a very life-changing book to read at the same time just like you I can't comprehend war I can't comprehend violence I don't know why we still where we are as, as species and uh, when I when I read the book uh, for, for for days I was almost speechless really because you know you you you, you feel you're empathic what he was mm -hmm. going through and, and, and all, all the others. Um, interestingly enough, uh, just six months ago or so, I was uh, given a book by um, a Jewish, uh, written by a Jewish Hungarian who was a friend of Viktor Frankl. And her name is uh, Edith Eve Egger. She is now, I think, 94 years old, and she had similar experiences to, uh, to him. She, with her family, was taken to Auschwitz, and uh, just right as they, they entered the camp, um, her mom was standing next to her, and the, uh, the, the Nazi god asked her, that, who, who is she? And she proudly said, she's my mom. Straight away, the mom was taken away. And it turned out that if she said her mom was a sister, she wouldn't have been taken away. So that was the first trauma already. And then you can imagine what she was going through as, a, as she was a dancer. She was, uh, she was asked, not asked, she was told to dance for Joseph Mengele. Mm -hmm. Just knowing that you have to perform for such evil person, knowing that her parents were already taken to the gas chamber and, and all the thing, horrific things she, she went through. Um, later, and she, she, she's a survivor, a Holocaust survivor with her, two of her, her sisters, none of her, her parents uh, survived. And um, she, she was married to another Jewish Hungarian, she had children and just trauma. Big time trauma was was really uh, carried on to to the next generation. She is now one of the uh, the, the best well known um, post traumatic um, uh, expert uh, living in the United States, and she published two books. One of which, which I'm going to put her name in the chat because I really suggest everybody to read her. Her book is, I think, called The Choice. I read it in Hungarian. Um, but I'd like, I, I, I got some experts from the book in Hungarian, so I tried to uh, translate it into English because this really ties so much to, to what you said. So this is one of the uh, things from her. She said, I want to help people to discover how they can escape the concentration camp of their own minds and become the person they should be. I want to have them experience what it means to get rid of their past, their failures and fears, their anger and stumbling, their remorse and their unresolved pains, to experience the freedom in which they can enjoy life in a full, rich, festive way. We cannot choose a life without pain, but we can choose to be free, escape from our past, no matter what happens and seize the opportunity. In a recent interview, she said the following, there are no problems, only challenges. There are no crises, only transformation. Don't ask why me, why this? Think about how to advance, how to move forward. When you blame somebody, you justify why not to do anything. If I feel as a victim, I look for an offender from whom I get an excuse, a pretense, why not to act? But I'm not a victim. I have been made as a victim, but this is not my identity. But what they have done to me, that's the difference. I refuse to be considered the victim. It is not myself. A lot of people are stuck in their past, but I like to cross the dark valleys. I don't run away from Auschwitz anymore but I don't live this is my wound that has blossomed and has a special place in my heart some of me stayed in a concentration camp but not the better part of me our lives are what we do with it we don't have to become victims I am here to show you how to turn evil into good how to find a gift in everything 
The worst conditions bring out the good in us. Auschwitz, for example, gave me the opportunity to develop my inner strength. So these are just, just a few thoughts from her which so much resonate with Viktor Frankl. And, uh, and it is really an, another amazing book. And no wonder those two, they became uh, friends. And, uh, and she, she really is amazing. And I'm sure that there were lots of other survivors. But uh, um, I, I really would, if you don't mind, Jim, I'd, I'd like to listen to, to our audience because I do feel a little bit fragile through, through your words and through what I read and just feeling that next door to me here in Hungary, what's going on. So before I get into tears, I rather hear yeah, maybe yeah. some of our others. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Georgie. And yeah, in our solidarity, you're there. Uh, she's in Hungary, everyone. She's right there. Has a, Hungary has a border with Ukraine and has mm -hmm. been absorbing, you know, ceaseless stream of refugees and so forth. So uh, uh, Georgie, as we speak, is 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 in uh, close to the war zones there, and so uh, uh, life is impinging on her in very uh, specific ways. Uh, let's go to Dave McCory, and I want to hear from all the other students here. Uh, so I want to get your hands up, uh, Dave. Good to see you again. Yes, indeed, Jim. Uh, just for the benefit of the audience, I'm. Uh, 79, retired. I did my PhD with wisdom uh, and uh, was the psychotherapist for 25 years. And as usual, I deeply appreciate the, the wisdom and the clarity that you bring to, uh, to your presentations. Uh, and in, in this particular case, Viktor Frankl's work on uh, the search for meaning just so clearly resonates with my own life journey. You know, I remember when I was 41 at one of my earliest uh, psychotherapy workshops, the uh, facilitator saying to me, Dave, you've got a really sad story. And not many people resolve that story. I didn't say anything to him, but internally I said, well, fuck you. I'm going to resolve it. Mm -hmm. And from my perspective, I have. Uh, my, my life at some level is deeply joyous. But I keep coming back to, particularly as a psychotherapist, I keep coming back to what is the difference that makes the difference for those people who somehow are able to recognize that it's, it's not about them, it's about life. Certainly, the, for me, the, the occurrence of mystery has been a mystical experiences has been a, a profound factor in that. What I noticed was really struck by in your talk today was the amount of synchronicity that occurred in, in the description. And, you know, thinking, well, what would Jung have made of this in terms of the occurrence of, of synchronicity? That somehow it made the difference for, for Franco. And as I say, I keep coming back to the question of how does one listen to what life offers so that one makes the, those authentic choices to become on the path of wisdom? Um, I don't have an answer to that, even after 25 years of being a psychotherapist. I know that my ability to offer compassion my, and my ability to challenge both of those were incredibly important. But I would say in my experience, only about 20% 20, 20 of people took up the offer. Most people simply wanted to get out of pain. They didn't want to get into wisdom. Mm. Anyway, my thoughts, Jim. <laughs> well, I think uh, you're right. I think as a general rule, you know, it's that 80-20 rule. You know, most people go along to get along and and don't think very deeply. They if they get uh, in a uh, circumstance, they just want out of it, but they're not interested in any kind of personal transformation. They're interested, as Freud said, in the pleasure principle. That's how most people govern their lives most of the time, or they get seduced by power, uh, etc. Um, but that twenty percent. Uh, you know, want a deeper dive and somehow uh, 
um, are triggered through some catharsis uh, in their lives to, uh, as Plato said, you know, get up from uh, the shackles in the cave and go to the front and see the sun for the, as if for the first time. So I, I think that's very true. You know, the, the great lines of Aeschylus, drop by drop, pain that cannot forget falls upon the heart until in our despair against our will comes wisdom by the awful grace of God. I think that's what um, uh, your uh, author, uh, Georgie uh, Victor Frankel, and I know enough of your story, Dave, to know that you too uh, trod that particular pathway. It's a deep one. And it takes us uh, in, through many twists and turns of the road, but it's the one ultimately that brings us to the light. And in that great lightness, uh, it, we discover the light that can shine in any darkness uh, and prevail. Yeah. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, Thanks, comment. Jim. And, and hi to Georgie. Yes. Good to see you, Georgie. Very good to see you. So I don't see any other hands up, everyone. Um, Leo, do you want to uh, say something? Uh, Barbara? Uh, Aida, there we go, Michael D. Molina, Michael, yes, Michael D. Molina, bring him on, Rick. Well, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you, Jim. It's so nice to be back after a little hiatus. Very and good to see you. Me. How are you doing, yeah, my friend? Nice to see you. <laughs> um, so I'm a, a graduate of Wisdom and Ubiquity with a PhD as well. It's just so great to be in the community again. And I could not not attend this great book session because I've recommended this book to just about every one of my clients as a psychotherapist for about You should have given years. the lecture. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and I realized I hadn't read it in the two years that I've been recommending it. So I, I took the invitation to reread. And uh, so happy to be here with your, uh, as, as usual, amazing um, exposition, Jim. I've so missed you. So the one thing I'd like to add to this, and perhaps you were already planning on visiting it next month, is that a, a part of logotherapy is a paradoxical intention. And uh, one of the things I re-remembered that I originally got from my study of logotherapy in the early days is humor. That humor does play a role in logotherapy, like officially in paradoxical intention. And uh, I re-realized that my tendency to use the correct type of humor to lead a client into exaggerating the worst possible situation and then introducing that paradox into the formula actually sets things in that stoic perspective that you were referencing earlier. And one of the connections I've just made then this month is that in uh, the School of Trauma-Informed Care, one of the neuroscience theories about how to treat trauma is called memory reconsolidation theory by Bruce Ecker. And the idea from a neuroscience point of view is that if we introduce paradox, into a, a memory that it rewrites the architecture of the memory itself physically in the brain. And humor seems, of course, we always say is the best medicine. It turns out there's a neuroscience reason for that. <laughs> and so uh, that's, that's uh, my, my contribution for the moment is how do we introduce paradoxical intention as Victor Frankl recommended to us, even in the direst of times. Yeah. Um, thank you, thank you all for for this. It's very uplifting. Thank you, Michael. So good to uh, feel your presence again. We should uh, have a call and catch up. Uh, and you know, this what Michael's saying. Uh, everyone is is really worth just underscoring that 
memory is not objective. It's subjective about the objective. Remember, we're all like the blind men and the elephant and memories shift over time. And as Michael says, you can, um, through inserting um, paradox or humor or other therapeutic processes, you can actually change your own memories. And that's an extraordinary thing. That, that the transformation of, of soul and heart, uh, in part, is a transformation of memory. And uh, we'll be getting into uh, some of those details of logotherapy uh, next time. It's a very rich uh, discipline, uh, logotherapy. So thank you, Michael. Uh, and then uh, I guess our final one will be Aida Merriweather. Aida, welcome. Well, thank you. Um, I, I'm a, a newbie to Frank Frankel, actually, but um, I'm in the middle of this kind of deconstruction process in my life. And so what you said, it, it was so encouraging because the markers are all different. And I'm in the process of choosing love over fear without pushing the fear away. And so it's all brand new territory. So I really, from the bottom of my heart, appreciate um, your, your being a guide at this point in my path. And it also just reminded me of my work with Angelus Arian, who talked about mm -hmm. each of us having unique medicine. And so that part of what you said really struck me. It's like, I, I know what I know that's true. I don't know quite what it is, but she would also say over and over, uh, the world needs your medicine. So I just wanted to offer that. Mm, thank you, Aida. Uh, I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm, I'm very gratified that you found uh, Victor uh, Frankel's book, uh, very helpful to you. It's been very helpful to me. It's been a good reminder in this time of what we need to uh, bear in mind uh, as we navigate through increasingly turbulent waters. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a good point to leave it for today. That Thank you. Uh, we have medicines um, that uh, we are accessible to us by just changing our perceptions about the world around us and empowering ourselves um, through a search for meaning uh, to gain insights and thereby agency uh, in a turbulent world. We'll go into logotherapy more deeply next time. Uh, Michael, if you're around, would love to uh, hear your views since you're uh, steeped in these matters. I know uh, from uh, uh, knowing who you are and what you do in the world professionally. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Uh, we will see you in one month's time, second Tuesday of April, uh, for a final lecture on Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning. Uh, Georgie, any final comment? Anything you want to say? Oh, well, thank you, Jim, so much. Well, I think I'd, I'd like to just quote Barbara Forbes' uh, comment uh, she put in a chat uh, for us. Uh, she said about the Stoics. Uh, oh, Marcus she, Aurelius, uh, yes. Yeah, she said that you have power over your mind and not outside events. Realize this and you will find strength. Yes. Thank you so much, Jim, for, your, for this amazing presentation. And uh, yeah, see you all in a month's time. Come to see you, everyone. Bye for now. See you in a month. The world will have changed many times Hopefully. by the time we meet again. You can rest <laughs> assured. That's why Viktor Frankl's admonitions are profoundly important for us all to contemplate. Okay, see you in a month. Bye for now. Bye.